Welcome to the Honest Mamas podcast, where we talk about the emotional and spiritual aspects of the motherhood journey. We are a team of honest mamas, myself, Melissa, Sophie, and Claire. We are psychotherapists, moms, and friends. Join us as we get real about the topics that matter to you. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 15 of the Honest Mamas podcast. I'm Melissa. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dee Yurgo. She describes herself as a woman-centric meditation coach, yoga coach, and teacher, and she runs fabulous yoga retreats. Today, we talk about how to find a deeper connection, not only to our emotional body, but also to our physical body. And we talk about how not every thought you think is true. It's so easy sometimes to just really believe what we keep on thinking. And we sort of go deep and dive deeper into how to come back to mindfulness as a mom. So please join us today for a conversation with Dee Yergo about meditation and mindfulness on the mamahood journey. Hi, Dee. Thank you so much for taking time out of your super duper busy schedule to join us today. Hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be interviewed for this. Absolutely. I thought of you because I know that, you know, you work with a lot of women. You're a yoga teacher, you're a meditation coach, you run retreats. And I know that most of your people that you come into contact with, I guess is the best way to say it, are women that are on this journey of motherhood. And when I was thinking about, and we were sort of chatting about the best kind of topics to talk about, because there's so many, what we sort of landed on, which I think is so important for women, myself, for other women out there on this, you know, journey to motherhood and being a mother is around intuition. Yeah, sure. And so I thought we could just dive in right there. And maybe if you can just share a little bit about kind of what your definition is for intuition, how you hold that. Sure. Well, I think of intuition as a deep knowing. And I think what confuses people sometimes is that when we think about knowing, we tend to value certain methods of acquiring knowledge. We think it has something to do with our cognitive minds, you know, proof and evidence, the ability to reason or deduce. And we often think about knowledge as something that comes from books or from school or something that we've been told by elders or society, or, you know, maybe at worst, something that we see on our Facebook feed. Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not saying that the traditional or modern ways of acquiring knowledge are wrong. Um, because they can be useful. But I really do think that the cognitive and thinking mind is overrated in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that we maybe rely on it too much. And what we don't realize is that not every thought that we think is true. Isn't that so hard? I would just pause for a second, because even as you say that, that is so hard to recognize. Yeah. um, And for me, what really illuminated that was the meditation practice. When you start to sit in meditation, and you realize how little jurisdiction you have over your own mind. Mm. It's a clue into the idea that not every thought that we think is necessarily true. Mm. So what's markedly different about intuition is that I believe it resides in the body. So everybody's heard about the term gut feeling. And I think that's a good start in order to understand the concept of intuition Because, you know, when you have that heavy feeling, that churning in the stomach, you know, let's say you're trying to make a decision, that can be a really big clue as to whether or not something is right or wrong. Mm. Um, And I think that we can refine it beyond the gut feeling once we develop an intimate relationship with our bodies. You know, I think that we can effectively use our bodies as tools and as barometers or compasses to give us direction and clear access to intuition. Yeah. And and I'm curious how you would recommend women to get kind of a more intimate, when you say an intimate relationship with their bodies, for women that are listening that have never even thought about that, what do you recommend some ways or some steps to kind of move into that, you know, understanding intuition, feeling into their bodies? Anything that you would say that might be helpful for them to kind of start the process? Sure. I mean, I think to begin with, everybody is born with a sense of intuition. 
I think women possess it even more strongly than men. Um, but what happens is that we're taught to ignore it or to question it. Mm. And I think a lot of this doubt comes from the patriarchal societal model that we're born into. Um, on some level, historically, a woman's intuition is viewed as a threat or something to be feared. And as girls from a very early age, we're not validated and we're taught to question ourselves. And when we start to think about developing a relationship with our bodies, um, that can be fraught with so much. Absolutely. Right? as far as body image, as far as how we feel about our bodies. Um, and for me, what really worked was the practice of yoga, um, as far as coming into what I think of as a communion with my body. And I think developing intuition, especially if it resides in the body, is starting to really be able to be present with ourselves. And for me, that relationship was cultivated on the mat. And what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, we, we show up for our yoga practice and we start to get into um, a relationship with how our bodies are feeling and how that changes. Mm. Um, the body can be a place where so much emotion resides. Um, past trauma can reside in the body. And I think that once we get on our mats and we start to get to know ourselves in this intimate, very detailed way. Like, what is happening in my hips? What am I holding on to? What are the poses that cause emotions to stir up? What are the poses that cause a release or a, a feeling of peace? Mm. We're able to start to distinguish and start to become a little bit more aware. Sometimes our bodies are something that we completely ignore. Absolutely. And then you get pregnant and you're like, oh my gosh, what is happening to my body? Yeah. <laughs> I have and a body? Pregnancy, and pregnancy above and beyond any other time in life, in my opinion, is a time where this access is probably most free and most accessible hmm. um, because we're going through these rapid changes. And from one day to the next, as the baby grows and as our hormonal landscape shifts, it's a time to really become aware because we're feeling so much, Absolutely. both on a physical level and on an emotional level. Yes. And it's actually, you know, when I think about it, it's probably one of the few times in our lives that so many people say to you constantly, how are you feeling? How are you feeling in your body? You know, yeah. have you have you felt the baby kick? Have you felt any movement in the baby? And, you know, for me, it was, you know, one of the few times that actually someone was very interested in my body and, and particularly the abdomen area, you know, kind of what's happening there, which is I know for a lot of us is where we hold a lot of emotional baggage. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, in my experience, when I was pregnant, it's when my yoga practice really began. And I started doing yoga four or five times a week. And it was this time of really deep, intuitive knowing. Um, it was a, the first time in my life that I actually valued and respected my body, because mm -hmm. it was holding my child. Um, so I started to develop a different attitude towards my own body. It was the first time I, I thought about my body and thought about nurturing and caring for my body. Because it wasn't just about me anymore. I right. was, you know, I had this baby that was, you know, being held in this container. And I wanted to, you know, practice, you know, healthy eating and get on the mat and really stretch and, you know, feel a connection to my body. You know, as you say that too, Dee, I'm also aware that that's also such a beautiful way to connect to your baby. And as you're talking about yoga and stretching, what I'm also hearing, and I know you'll probably agree with this, is such a deep slowing down. Yeah, sure. And a heightened level of awareness. Yes. And I think that very naturally through the pregnancy process, our awareness level is heightened because it needs to be from a mammalian instinct perspective. So it's a beautiful opportunity to be able to tune and in, into that awareness and really start to develop a relationship with what is it that I'm feeling? How do I see myself? What do I need? What does this baby need? So it's, it's really a unique time in life. And I think it, it can be, um, depending on our attitude toward it, it can be a time of incredible empowerment. And, and a turning inward. You know, I think so much in our culture, we're so sort of programmed when somebody's having a baby a lot of the times of what are you going to buy? And is it a boy or girl? What, what should we dress the baby in? And what does the nursery look like? And you know, even going to visit the hospital, if that's the birth path you choose, I mean, that's all wonderful and needs to happen. But there isn't much time, I think, sort of customarily in our culture, unless we as mamas kind of carve it out for ourselves 
to really slow down and to really acknowledge, you've said it a couple times so far, which I totally agree with, is that there is this heightened sense of awareness. And for myself, I don't know about you, Dee, but when I was pregnant, I mean, my senses were heightened, my emotions at times were heightened, but also my connection to my spirituality was very much heightened also. Yes. I, you know, it's, it's a topic I think about all the time, and I think it's a beautiful opportunity uh, to deepen our sense of spirituality, no matter how we feel about, you know, whatever religion we were raised in, in our family of origin, or no matter what our relationship is with um, God or a lack of God, let's say, mm-hmm. um, I think that being spiritual is not mutually exclusive. And I think it's a really beautiful, because I think of spirituality as a deep connection to self. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that motherhood, new motherhood and, and the process of pregnancy and the journey uh, of pregnancy is an incredible time, an auspicious time to come into a, a sort of spiritual awareness or, or maybe the beginning of a spiritual path. Mm. And, and I think another piece that's so important also is to just really trust the unfolding of what that looks like. I mean, as you said, everybody's got sort of someone different or maybe no one that they sort of lean to or call on or however it may look in terms of your own spirituality. But, you know, I think that there's, I think what you just said also really deeply resonated with spirituality being a deep connection to self. I don't know why I've never really heard it said so clearly before. It's just so beautiful and simple and yet so very deep when you say it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's really interesting because I went through this phase, I was raised Catholic. And so basically with this concept of God as creator, sort of the way that I envisioned it as a child was sort of an old man in the sky with a long white beard, maybe holding like a staff or something. (laughs) And then, you know, when I started college, you know, via my first intro to philosophy course, freshman year of college, I sort of unequivocally rejected the entire thing. Mm. And in a way, I feel pretty much maybe threw the baby, what's that phrase, threw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing? Oh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yep. (laughs) So, It wasn't until my yoga and meditation practice deepened that at one point during a deep meditation, I had this sort of aha moment and I realized that maybe I had misunderstood the whole thing and maybe, you know, God was not this sort of creator, you know, old dude with the white beard and maybe God was actually within me and it was kind of like this aha moment and everything was different from that day forward. I just started to, instead of rejecting everything that I had heard um, and, and been raised into, I just started to reconsider a lot. And I think I'm still going through that process. But for me, becoming a mother, the practices of yoga, the practices of meditation began to awaken me in a way that rather than reject the entire system, I started to figure out how can I make this a really individual path and how can this be very unique to me and um, how can I redefine this idea of God, um, and maybe make it rather than creator or controller or punisher, what could I do to recreate it as deep connection to intuition and to self? That's really beautiful. Really beautiful. And so if we circle back to the feeling of intuition, you know, I work with a lot of women in my practice and couples, but primarily women that come in and talk about how they really want to come in and get support in finding their authentic voice and what that sounds like, that it's different maybe than their family or parts of it are the same, parts of it don't work anymore. And so many of my clients really have a hard time distinguishing, you know, once they sort of get a little bit in touch with their gut feeling or their intuition, it then becomes sometimes challenging between, you know, and especially new moms when anxiety is rampant and, you know, flurry and flights of ideas. Is there a way that you could maybe share to help women maybe start to distinguish between fear that emerges inside and in the gut or kind of grounded intuition? Well, fear. Okay, so fear is an emotion. And I don't think that fear and intuition are necessarily mutually exclusive. And I don't think that fear is inherently a bad thing. Mm. And I think it's important to distinguish between the fear that resides in the body and fearful or anxious thinking. So sometimes feeling fear, if it's coming from a place of deep intuition, maybe it's a clue that we're on the wrong track, but the way it would manifest itself is in the body. So let's say you were trying to make a decision, like let's say you have a job offer, and you sit quietly with yourself, you close your eyes, 
you're considering the offer and you feel a constriction around the throat or you feel slightly short of breath. Those can be physical symptoms that we associate with fear, but in this particular instance, maybe it's your intuition telling you that this is not the right move for your career. And I find that it's different than fearful or anxious thoughts. You know, like we said earlier, not every thought is true. And many times the thought that the thoughts that we think are really a symptom of our social condi- conditioning, messages that we heard in childhood, mm. what we think other people would think. And sometimes that's illuminated by the meditation practice. You know, like we said before, sometimes via the practice, we find that we don't have a lot of control over our thoughts. Mm. And when we become accustomed to how our thoughts behave, we learn not to put too much stock into every random thought. So I think that there is a distinguishing that comes with practice over anxious thoughts you know, like those runaway, you know, sometimes irrational mm. fears and that deep sort of sense of this is wrong. It's like, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the example of, you know, the elevator opens and if you're, if you're feeling something in your body, don't get into the elevator, right? Yes. There was a, a man that wrote a book about that. Yeah. And so I think that because we're, con- we, we're constantly questioned and, and, and as little girls, unless we're very lucky, we're not often validated. And we're also conditioned to be polite. Yes. You know, and and acceptable. Our behavior has to be acceptable and it has to fit into some sort of societal expectation or societal mold. A lot of times we are taught to bypass that over and over and over again. So we wind up becoming adults. And the practice of distinguishing between fear that's real because you're in danger or fear that's real because it's a bad decision or it's a bad move for your life often gets clouded and muddied up with anxious thinking. Or even fear of this, you know, this kind of trusting my gut has never really been allowed or brought forward. And so that could also be the push and pull possibility of this feels uncomfortable maybe at first to kind of know my intuition, but then, oh no, how do I communicate that? And that brings up a whole nother slew of emotions. Right, right. And intu- intuition, we have to remember, is incredibly individual. So a lot of times with the women that I work with um, in the capacity of yoga teacher or meditation coach, um, I also, you know, I also give the advice to drop the committee. Not, not every decision <laughs> requires a committee. And I, I don't think the committees always serve us. I, it's so it's so funny. Are you talking, are you speaking to both the committee internally and the committee externally? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of the external committee because a lot of times when we're faced with any kind of major decision, we are making 25 phone calls to figure <laughs> out what should, what do you think I should do, right. which is a little bit absurd if you think about it, because what do you think you should do? Right. I tell that story so many times when I became a new mom. I've talked about it so much on this podcast, but when I became a new mom, no one in the beginning days, no one said to me, no one said to me, what do you think, mom? You've carried this baby for nine months. You've had them living inside of you. What do you think? It was finally when my therapist, you know, sat me down one evening and I was sharing with her and she looked at me and she said, Melissa, what do you want to do? What do you think? And I was like, oh, wait, what? Where have I been? Seriously, I've been asleep. I was completely, you know, when you talk about the committee and giving birth, I was handing it over to, oh, the doctor must know more. Oh, this person must know more. Oh, that person must know more. Oh, the breastfeeding person must know more. And it brought up so much anxiety. And when I finally was able to kind of, I kind of explain it as sitting back in myself, like as you imagine sitting back in a chair and really feeling grounded Mm. and taking a deep breath, it number one brought about so much calm when I was feeling very anxious. But number two, it, it kind of opened up so many other possibilities for me that I never thought of. I thought it was I had to do what everybody else said I had to do. Yeah, isn't that an amazing revelation? But it was always there the whole time, right? And then it takes something like that to make us see that, wait, hold on a second. You know, I I can have ownership, self-agency, you know? And for a lot of us, this is maybe, maybe motherhood is the first time that we even consider that. I mean, it was for me. But then once you're able to step into your self-agency, that is where your power resides. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I and I guess for any women that are that are listening that are in, you know, whether you're trying to get pregnant or 
pregnant in labor or, you know, kind of fourth trimester, have a new baby, even just to, if you're listening to this podcast, to just take a deep breath and to just come back to you for a moment. Really just ask yourself, what is it that I need? What is it that I want? And just notice what comes up. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as we we kind of talk about intuition, anything else that you would say that would be helpful for women to sort of start trusting and leaning on that feeling? You know, I think that sometimes it's, sometimes maybe we're making it a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. So for instance, um, when I'm teaching prenatal yoga, a lot of times, um, you know, one of, you know, your classic warmups from hands and knees are, are cat and cow tilts for whoever's familiar with yoga. Um, a lot of times, many yoga classes will start with these very simple movements. You're just on hands and knees and, you know, you're starting to move the spine. But one direction that I always give to women is from hands and knees, close your eyes and then just start to move in whatever way feels good to you. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's moving the left hip all the way out to the left and making the head really heavy and taking a few breaths there. Maybe it's making circles with the hips. So whatever it is, I think too, too many times, and a lot of times I see it in class, right? So I'll give those instructions, like do whatever feels good, and I'll pause. And you'll have women who have a little bit more access to that, that'll be able to close their eyes and just start to sway and move in any way that's organic. And then you have some students, especially if they're newer to the practice, that will look around the room. Mm. Um, and, you know, and looking for some sort of direction because it's almost putting them in an uncomfortable place to not have specific instructions. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily good or bad, but I think it's important. I always encourage my students to notice that, right? Um, if when they heard that, if they were able to close their eyes and get right into it, or if they started to, if their eyes started to dart all around the room, looking outside of themselves to find what they should do for themselves. So I think a beautiful home practice is to get on hands and knees and be quiet and start to notice, how does my right wrist feel today? You know, what's happening with my hips? What's going on with my lower back? What do I need in this moment to nurture myself? Is it fast movement? Is it really slow movement? Is it a different pose altogether, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps it's outside walking. I mean, even that can sort of be a deep inquiry or moving meditation. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's whatever, it's wherever you can feel your body. And so because, you know, I'm so committed to yoga and I've been practicing for so long, my go-to is usually on the mat, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, and a lot of people have a lot of physical practices where they can, um, they, they find themselves and they're able to connect with sensation. Um, but what I'm talking about is being able to, rather than, um, if your instinct is to Google on YouTube and look for an online class. That's, that's one method, right? <laughs> but there's a whole nother method of getting into your own body and giving yourself or teaching yourself what is it that you need. It's And going back to exactly what you said, we don't have to make it complicated. And I know for myself, you know, especially when I first started meditating, I would do everything I could or, or practicing yoga to sort of not face myself. I would talk to other people. I would call friends. I would do all these other things even in, in a way of distraction, uh -huh. because it is really powerful when we are quiet. I mean, if you've ever done a silent meditation retreat, oh my goodness. I mean, there were so many times I had my bags packed, keys in hand. I was like, I'm done. I'm out of here. And I'd start marching down the hills at Spirit Rock in California in San Francisco. Right. And I would just start marching down the hill like, no, I'm done. I can't deal with this. This is like a prison. And I'd somehow turn myself around, heave back up the hill, kind of my head hung. It was an extremely humbling experience. But I am so grateful for those times that I've really, instead of running outside of myself, I've really just sat down, literally sat down and just closed my eyes and come back to myself. It can be a very, very scary process, particularly silent meditation. And I've, um, si I'm sorry, silent retreat. And I've noticed um, over the years of teaching retreats that a lot of times people step into that quite willingly. And many, many times, you know, I'll have email exchanges with people prior to retreat who are having a great deal of anxiety, even about just the very idea of prolonged periods of silence. Mm. And it's been very rare. I, I, I've only once or twice had a situation where um, post-retreat people were still uncomfortable with silence. Usually people find that in long periods of silence comes a certain amount, for lack of a better word, magic. 
Mm. Because we are forced, just because of our regular to-do list, our day-to-day, our jobs, our parenting, um, our relationships with our partners, et cetera, and everybody else around us, we have so much responsibility in moving energy outwards, outside of ourselves all the time. As women, we're caregivers and caretakers. And so to have this, these beautiful situations where you can just simply be quiet and not have to figure out what is this person saying? What am I going to say next? How do I want to be viewed and portrayed? And just simply be quiet. It can be incredibly empowering and it can be incredibly revealing as far as what we we're talking about before with the relationship with self and, and coming into communion with self. Absolutely. I even remember at the, you know, the dining hall, and usually the pleasantries when someone would hold a door for you or where you'd meet someone's gaze. And they really just gently guided us not to smile. That was such a, you know, kind of first impulse is to smile. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what would it be like just to look at someone's gaze and look away or perhaps even not meet their gaze? And it, it is, it's, it just really reveals how conditioned we are, I think, especially as women. I noticed that in myself, like they're going to think I'm rude or they're going to think I'm mean or, you know, what are they going to think? And who's this person? And I'm making all these judgments of other people and myself. That was like day one, you know, (laughs) like what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. And isn't it incredibly liberating, right? To not have to do that at all. You just don't have to talk. You don't have to make eye contact. You just get to be with yourself. The amount of energy you save is absolutely incredible. And yeah, it is. If if no one's ever done one before, they are magical. And I know, Dee, you run some really wonderfully sounding retreats. So I do hope to do one of yours shortly. Oh, I would love to have you. Thank you. So thank you so much for you know chatting with me today. And if people want to hear a little bit more about you know how to find you or kind of keep up to date with where you are in the world, how do they do that? Oh, sure. So I have two different websites, deyergo.com, which is my first and last name, D-E-E-Y-E-R-G-O.com. And um, my prenatal studio, well, my prenatal program, because we're running classes in two different locations now, is uh, pranaprenatalyoga.com. And prana is spelled P-R-A-N-A. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Melissa. This was great. Yes. Thank you so much, Dee. Thanks so much for joining us today for today's episode number 15 of the Honest Mamas podcast. What I loved about today's conversation with Dee was such a reminder as a mom how to come back to our intuition. And if we don't know what that is, how to start the exploration and the journey of self-discovery to really trying to connect with who you are on the inside. So to get our show notes and more information, you can go to www.honestmamas.com forward slash episode 15. Also join our community on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com forward slash honest mamas community, where these conversations and way more will continue. 